Dobro večer, mlad još jedno izdanje emisije Načisto na televiziji Vijesti. Sa nama u studiju je ambasador Savezne Republike Njemačke, gospodin Pius Fischer. Mr. Fischer, welcome and thank you for your time. Good evening, Mr. Komnenic. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Let's start with this. Local elections in Berane have brought to light some demands made earlier by European government. Commission. The opposition has overtaken the power in Beran after eight years, uh, despite, according to their claims, uh, some serious election misconduct. Uh, opposition representatives claim that they are in possession of lists with names and of people and exact amounts of money given, mm. accordingly, to those people by DPS activists on the election <coughs> day. My question is for you is, do you see recent events in Beran as a continuance, as a part of the case Snimak, whose resolution was insisted upon by the European Commission? Well, uh, we still do not have all uh, the details about what happened uh, really in uh, Berani, but the European Union and its member states, particularly Germany, made it repeatedly very clear to, uh, to uh, the political parties and uh, to the Montenegrin government that uh, it is of paramount importance for us that the electoral process um, will not be overshadowed uh, actually by renewed uh, allegations uh, of abuse uh, of uh, public resources for party political purposes. And for this reason, uh, uh, actually originally a uh, commission was established uh, to come up with proposals uh, to improve the electoral uh, process. Mm -hmm. This commission, however, uh, even though they uh, drafted uh, four new laws or amendments to existing uh, laws on party financing, uh, on the electoral lists, uh, etc., could not complete uh, its work uh, because no agreement was found uh, on uh, the law on uh, the election of uh, municipal councillors and uh, members of parliament. Do you so, recognize the obstruction in that process? Uh, well, um, every compromise needs actually concessions on both sides, on the side uh, of the ruling parties and the opposition, and we don't believe that boycott uh, is a solution. Uh, uh, such problems can be resolved uh, only uh, by compromise and uh, in dialogue, uh, and unfortunately at the moment uh, there is a stalemate uh, in these uh, talks. So but on the other hand, uh, hand, we have claimed that the uh, Democratic Party of Socialists and one minority party are uh, misusing uh, allegedly these demands for um, affirmative action on the local level uh, in order to uh, create the uh, uh, I think it climate would be for the local wrong, elections in uh, Podgorica. So. It would be a wrong approach, so to say, to um, uh, make this uh, blame game, uh, that each side is blaming the other uh, for boycotting or for uh, 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 actually making uh, these negotiations uh, so, so difficult. Whatever the motives uh, of the ruling uh, party are, I think now it's the time for the ruling party and for the opposition to restart actually the dialogue and uh, find a solution because we cannot continue. We had these problems at the uh, time when we had parliamentary elections here. We had these problems uh, during the presidential elections and now it's continued uh, during the uh, municipal elections. And uh, also what... But uh, even, even the president of the parliament said, I think, yesterday yeah. that these demands for affirmative action on the local uh, level are the way to break down the civil society in Montenegro. What's your position on that? Uh, you know, we do not uh, actually interfere... He's still in a uh, ruling coalition. <laughs> uh, we do not interfere in the micromanagement uh, of legislation uh, here in Montenegro. I think Montenegrins should know best uh, what really fits uh, the particular situation uh, which you have in your country. 
what we are demanding is only actually that the framework conditions for holding elections at the parliamentary or at the municipal level are fair and give uh, actually fair chances uh, to all political forces uh, to present themselves. I understand. Uh, to the uh, you stated earlier that uh, case Snimag showed to say the least uh, amazing uh, negligence when it comes to responsibility for public uh, resources. Brussels insisted uh, on determining both political and judicial responsibility. Uh, while the Premier, Prime Minister, Milo mm. Djukanovic, uh, stated on several occasions confronting these uh, demands that this case was closed as far as he was concerned. Former state prosecutor stated before that there were no elements of criminal offense in this case, while, while now the prosecution is uh, running processes against some lower level activists all over Montenegro. Are you satisfied <coughs> with the institutional response in this particular matter? Um. Actually, uh, we are not satisfied uh, to say it uh, clearly, and um, it's not a demand only raised by EU bureaucrats. This is uh, actually a very important uh, issue, and if um, the use of public resources uh, was considered for, to, uh, for party political purposes, even if it was only considered uh, it would be, so to say, a breach uh, of uh, basic principles uh, of the rule of law. And uh, certain things uh, which have been said in these uh, party meetings uh, which were taped um, should mean, never uh, have one been... One job position equal four votes for us uh, or something like that. Should never have been said uh, at all. This is uh, very clear. And uh, even if none of these uh, things were really committed and if there were no breaches uh, of the penal code, nevertheless, um, these uh, discussions revealed a mentality and a mindset uh, which is inconsistent uh, actually with our understanding of uh, the rule of law. But uh, even if we have not seen, so to say, uh, judicial consequences, um, uh, what is positive, actually, that the issue of the SNEMAC affair was publicly discussed uh, and in the future I am absolutely sure the threshold for discussing such things uh, or for committing uh, uh, such abuses will be much higher. But, uh, so government, uh, uh, I have to stop you right here. Uh, government's critiques and opposition say that <coughs> what happened in Berane Mm -hmm. uh, came as a result of the fact that there were no sanctions against key people responsible in case Snemek. Yeah, well, uh, this is, uh, of course... Uh, you uh, mentioned yourself some statements uh, yeah. said, stated um, by high DPS officials. If it's really true, actually, that there uh, were uh, people paid uh, to vote uh, for the ruling uh, party, it would be, of course, uh, a serious uh, violation uh, of uh, the law, and it would be against the spirit, actually, of um, what has been discussed uh, beforehand. So, Do you find uh, convincing explanation given by ruling uh, Democratic Party of Socialists that these lists with names and amounts uh, are their parties and their private lists. Of course, every party has uh, lists of their potential uh, supporters uh, and voters. Uh, if it's uh, only uh, lists uh, of this with kind, and, uh, uh, but if it's with amounts uh, and with signatures uh, of uh, people having received uh, such amounts, uh, it would be uh, something uh, actually which has to be investigated uh, by the judicial authorities uh, of uh, Montenegro. So it was certainly not a good example for the improvement of the electorate uh, of the electoral uh, climate um, and the conditions in which uh, municipal elections uh, will be held uh, here in Montenegro. 
And after Berani, there will be, I think, 11 more for municipal elections uh, here in Montenegro. And it's absolutely and sure to make uh, yeah. sure that all these elections, particularly those uh, in Podgorica, uh, will be uh, fair and free and that there will be no rigging, uh, actually, or attempts uh, to influence uh, the voters um, uh, in the, during the electoral mm -hmm. campaign. But speaking of determining responsibility, you praised uh, legislative mm -hmm. uh, improvements in Montenegro. However, there are still frequent comments uh, that system is not being any more functional and independent. Uh, we have an acting state prosecutor uh, for quite some time now. Uh, the mandate of the president of the Supreme Court has expired a while ago. There is also a vacant seat uh, in the Senate of the State Audit Institution. Uh, how does that sound to you? Yeah, these, does it look good at all? Um, are of course uh, also consequences of the uh, very high uh, requirements uh, for uh, the appointment of a new prosecutor general. This can be done only with a two-thirds majority and it's very difficult given the polarization which we have in the parliament to uh, achieve a two-thirds uh, majority for uh, the nomination and uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, installment of a new uh, prosecutor general. But uh, I'm still confident uh, that um, this uh, will be resolved, hopefully very soon, because as long as we do not have a prosecutor general, of course, uh, also in the fight against corruption and organized crime, maybe we will not see the successes which would be necessary to establish a convincing track record uh, of Montenegro in this uh, area. In this matter. Uh, but how so, well founded are the claims that the judicial reform and agreed election models uh, cannot provide good result until um, they are a part of the current political constellation in which long-lasting ruling Democratic Party of Socialists uh, as opposition claim controls every single cell of the society. To what extent is such political <coughs> um, ambient diminishing the value uh, of the candidate selection uh, process. Do you think it discourages people with uh, prominent careers uh, who are convinced that they cannot make any achievement without uh, party membership card? This is certainly a risk. Uh, the demands and expectations uh, in a future uh, prosecutor general are so high that there will be very few people uh, actually who will be ready and who have the qualification uh, to be candidates uh, for this uh, position. And given actually the uh, polarization uh, in the parliament, uh, it is extremely difficult uh, to get a two-thirds or even three-fifths uh, majority for the nomination of such a person. I think all the political parties um, should uh, better work uh, together to end this uh, deadlock because this is actually something uh, which blocks uh, the situation here in Montenegro and what we want to see is actually results uh, and as long as uh, these positions uh, are vacant we will not see the results uh, which we are expecting. Uh, should we look for a candidate who, were, uh, who was not the part of this uh, system? I think it would be best uh, to have independent uh, candidates uh, who are not affiliated with any one of the political parties uh, and which stand out actually by their personal qualifications. This would be uh, the ideal uh, situation. Uh, but concerning these claims that uh, ruling pa party controls mm -hmm. almost everything in Montenegro, uh, for instance, former Prime Minister uh, Igor Lukšić, DPS's Vice President, uh, recently wrote on DPS's blog uh, that, uh, I'll quote him, partitocracy is threatening to enter all pores of the system, even more than it was the case during times of a single party system. <laughs> 
Does this sound uh, discouraging to any possible candidate uh, in this process? Well, how, even though the how the, do you interpret even, this? Even though the DPS uh, has a very dominating position uh, in uh, Montenegro and had this position uh, over a long period of time. Uh, I think the fact uh, that the opposition won the elections uh, in Berani now and that uh, in Ulcin, for example, a uh, coalition will be formed without uh, the, the DPS shows that there are alternatives uh, and uh, that change, democratic change by elections is possible in Montenegro and that this has not yet uh, happened uh, at the national level I think is not only a consequence uh, of the overwhelming power of the DPS, it's also a consequence of the division which we have um, uh, amongst the opposition uh, parties and um, it's um, a consequence of the fact that the opposition so far could not provide a real alternative, uh, present itself as a real alternative uh, to the uh, ruling uh, coalition. So um, I think it's not only uh, what so do you to see as the main problem when it comes DPS, to opposition uh, is controlling uh, everything. Of course, uh, I mean a party which has been in power for such a long time uh, had so two many possibilities, uh, two and a half decades. And every uh, party which is in power for such a long time shows after a certain time a wear and tear uh, and has to be replaced uh, by elections um, and uh, finds a time uh, in the opposition to regenerate itself. That's why actually uh, this is uh, the democratic game uh, in uh, functioning uh, democracies. But but what do you see as the main problem uh, when you yeah. mentioned this? Um, the opposition and its offer. Well, it's both, um, uh, it's both uh, it's the uh, division amongst the opposition parties. Uh, even, uh, I mean, for the Democratic Front, it's sometimes very difficult uh, to define positions which satisfy the two constituents uh, mm -hmm. of the Front. Uh, because PSP and uh, NOVA have uh, very different ideas uh, on certain issues in foreign policy, for Such example. Such as NATO, for and, instance, uh, but we'll talk about for, that uh, for example, later on. NATO, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, well, let's stay on this topic uh, a little bit more. Fighting against uh, organized crime and uh, corruption is one of the main challenges after opening chapters 22 and mm. 24. You said earlier <coughs> that decisions made by the appellate court uh, to return cases Zavala and Sharic to the uh, beginning have disappointed you because these cases were offered by the government as uh, key evidence of its commitment to fight against these phenomena. Uh, many state officials, some of them, including some people from the judicial branch, uh, did not appreciate such position of <laughs> yours. Uh, actually, they even accused you indirectly, though, uh, that this statement could be interpreted as interfering with the independency of judiciary. What was the point of your message? I this think this uh, remark uh, which I made uh, was misunderstood uh, by some, particularly by the <coughs> defendants uh, in these uh, two cases, uh, Mr. Marovic uh, in and, and some, others, uh, some other defendants in the Savala case, they came to the embassy and what I explained to them, uh, we do not want to prejudge anybody, we do not want to have show trials. But these two cases, Savala and the Sharic case, were presented to us, uh, so to say, as evidence of the political will and of the ability of the judicial system to fight corruption in Montenegro. And uh, these two cases were presented to us as evidence just before the Council of the European Union mm -hmm. in June 2012 uh, decided to give Montenegro the green light for opening accession negotiations. And then one year later, the appellate court, uh, and this was during the presidential elections, scrapped, so to say, uh, these uh, two verdicts uh, and uh, sent them back to the first instance uh, court. That means we are back to square one. 
That means so far uh, we have not any evidence uh, that corruption or organized crime at the very highest uh, level are really uh, properly investigated and tried uh, in Montenegro. What does that if, mean? If, uh, you, if <laughs> actually the defendants uh, in the Savala case are innocent, they have to be acquitted, uh, no doubt. Uh, but it shows to us uh, actually that um, there are certain deficiencies uh, in the judicial system because um, in the verdict uh, passed against uh, the Sharic uh, brother and uh, some of his uh, collaborators, apparently mistakes have been made, uh, judicial mistakes, which were very serious and which raise the question, uh, is it incompetence um, or uh, is it intention? In any case, uh, it was not, uh, so to say, something uh, which um, gave us the confidence uh, that uh, there is a full power of the judicial and political system. But what would um, you say on that? You said yourself that the government has used as argument cases with uncertain judicial epilogues. Uh, does this mean that you do not recognize the political will of the government? Or does that mean that you think that government is trying to fake out this process? To be uh, very direct I, I, I don't uh, believe uh, that the government does not have uh, the political will. Um, by actually talking uh, to the Minister of Justice, uh, to uh, actually people uh, in responsible uh, positions, I really um, gained uh, the impression that there is a political will uh, to fight corruption and organized crime. And this is key, actually, uh, to make progress in the accession talks. Is that but, enough, promises? But it's not enough. It's not enough. Um, you have to have uh, also the capacity uh, to do it. And um, the judicial system so far, I think, uh, is uh, not yet uh, in a position uh, really uh, to live up to these high expectations uh, which we have uh, in them. Uh, we have still have a backlog uh, of uh, many unresolved cases in the judicial system. Uh, many first instance uh, verdicts uh, are always annulled uh, by the higher courts uh, and uh, I think a serious reform uh, is necessary to make the judicial uh, system more efficient uh, and more effective. Uh, but I do not doubt uh, the political will. I think it's a problem of capacity also. Mm -hmm. You once said in presence of the president of Supreme uh, Court, court yeah, yeah. and I quote, uh, you need to bring, mm. Montenegro needs to bring uh, sentences which will convince you members that there is political will and capability to fight corruption and organized crime. The EU Council of Ministers so has also sent a message that Montenegro must pay special attention to firm, measurable results. At the same time, uh, high state officials keep trying to convince public in Montenegro that there are no demands in terms of investigations, arrests, judicial sentences, and that all these are uh, misinterpreted, misinterpretations mm -hmm. served by uh, government critiques and some private media. So I'll ask you a straightforward question. Would concrete investigations, arrests, and court sentences be key indi indicators in determining uh, commitment to resolving these issues? Uh, it's very difficult actually to have uh, measurable criteria for the track record uh, in fighting uh, corruption and organized crime because uh, the judicial system uh, is not, so to say, a factory which produces verdicts uh, like cars or sausages or anything uh, like that. And as I said already, we do not want to have any show trials which are just presented uh, actually uh, to show uh, that something is done in this uh, area. And we know that particularly in the area of corruption, evidence is sometimes very difficult uh, to present uh, in such a way uh, that uh, the defendants can be convicted uh, and uh, tried. 
So, for, but in the end, of course, we expect results, and results are cases uh, where actually people who committed actually bribery, uh, who um, uh, broke the rules, uh, who were involved in drug trafficking, uh, uh, in human trafficking, uh, high level uh, corruption, uh, high level corruption uh, are actually uh, sentenced um, and uh, tried. So uh, there are some uh, ongoing investigations yeah. uh, against uh, X and. Uh, current uh, mayors of municipalities in uh, uh, Montenegro and yeah. I'm not going uh, to I don't want to comment, comment on, on, on this uh, because but how, to prevent, yeah. Yeah. how to prevent uh, selective approach that's what we can hear here in Montenegro uh, s s suspicion mm. that uh, those investigations some of them are being conducted selectively and that they are ordered from some political centers. Yeah, this is of course uh, an outflow of uh, the general climate uh, of mistrust. Uh, so um, um, it's always actually the assumption uh, that if somebody is tried, uh, it's done on a selective uh, basis. If this is true or not, it's very difficult uh, for, for us to judge. But in the end, uh, we want to re see results, but we cannot define, so to say, clearly that we want to have 12 verdicts uh, every year or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's not quantifiable um, um, in uh, mathematical terms. Uh, but um, in the end, uh, of course, we have to see uh, that there are cases uh, which are properly investigated uh, and uh, where verdicts uh, are passed because otherwise um, there will be a climate of impunity and this is very dangerous. If those uh, who are involved in corruption feel uh, that uh, they will get away with anything, that would be the worst thing uh, what could happen. Uh, I think there has to be a climate uh, where uh, the risk to be caught and tried is very high. Mm -hmm. Opposition believes that it is irrational to expect uh, from the government, which they consider responsible yeah. for uh, creating all of these problems mm -hmm. that we are talking about, to tackle these uh, issues. And I most certainly do not expect you to <laughs> uh, comment on these uh, and similar political positions directly. However, I, I would be interested in learning your view on the fact that you mentioned uh, before that Montenegro is the only country in the region and even in the Europe, uh, with the same party in power for 25 years. If alternation of power is an essential element of democracy, uh, where are we then from your point of view as a society? Uh, Montenegro is a country in transformation and um, this is my fourth ambassadorial uh, post. Uh, I've been in Africa in a country uh, which uh, was a socialist uh, country uh, led uh, by Sekou Touré for a long time. And uh, I was in Cambodia, which was a communist country where the Khmer Rouge established the most extreme form of communism. In Mongolia, everywhere I was faced with the same uh, problems. And you cannot... That's interesting what examples and parallels did you just uh, draw? Uh, in Mongolia, for example, we had change uh, of government by uh, elections. And uh, the ruling party, uh, which has been in power in, in Mongolia for a very long period of time, uh, eventually, uh, so to say, lost the elections and was uh, replaced... Um, uh, by a uh, new uh, government. This may be uh, happening in, in the future, but uh, I think this alone is not a measure for uh, a functioning democracy because at the state level in Germany we have examples uh, also where one, power, uh, one party has been in power for a very long period of time, but nobody would uh, put uh, in question, so to say, uh, the democratic uh, uh, setup uh, of uh, this uh, state in Germany. So um, 
but uh, definitely, of course, um, uh, something has to happen. But first of all, the opposition has to get its act uh, together because if the opposition remains as highly divided as it is right now, as the opposition does not provide uh, a, a real alternative uh, to the ruling uh, coalition, also if it comes, uh, so to say, um, to, uh, for, so to say, the identity uh, question in Montenegro is not uh, a nation state in our understanding, it's a state of citizens uh, because uh, you have different backgrounds. Uh, there are Montenegrins, uh, Serbs, Albanians, Bosniaks, Croatians, uh, and others. Uh, you're a multi ethnic and multi religious uh, country. And uh, that's why any political party has to appeal to all these different constituents uh, of your uh, society. Do you have an impression that the uh, ruling party is uh, misusing those identity issues? No, I don't think that they are misusing it. Uh, I think uh, they are addressing this uh, issue. Uh, and they um, have a higher integrative, uh, um, so to say, appeal to the electorate. Because I'm always uh, surprised uh, the people here in Montenegro, they are reading uh, uh, to a large extent uh, the government critical press, uh, Viesti, Dan, and, and other papers. Two thirds of the Montenegrins uh, who read papers read these papers. But when it comes to the elections, they elect uh, actually the DPS. So uh, I think the reason is um, to some extent uh, that. Uh, they want to be on the safe side, so to say, and I think the opposition parties or they have just to get want to know what's read, really going on rid in the state. of uh, a certain image uh, which they acquired uh, uh, in the past, and the fact uh, that the Democratic Front uh, has a such highly respectable uh, figure now uh, as uh, leader uh, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, uh, might change uh, the situation. Mm -hmm. Speaking about uh, media. Relevant international reports point out serious concern over frequent attacks uh, on media representatives who are not controlled by the government, as well as over the fact that uh, perpetrators have not been discovered for years uh, now. Following significant pressure by international community, the police, right before the local election, I must mention, uh, made public that they have taken two suspects for the latest bomb attack on daily VST. In general, how do you see the dynamics and the method of conducting these investigations? It is clear that for uh, the European Union and uh, <coughs> uh, for us uh, in Germany, uh, freedom of the media uh, is of utmost uh, importance uh, in uh, a democratic uh, uh, society. The media have the role of a fourth power next uh, to the uh, executive, which is the government, the legislative, which is the parliament, and uh, the judiciary. The media should uh, provide actually checks and balances against these other uh, three powers. The the task of the media is to inform the public, to investigate uh, actually the abuse uh, of power and uh, make uh, such issues uh, public. And any attack uh, on representatives of the media f uh, is, uh, so to say, from our perspective, an attempt to intimidate uh, the media not to report about certain things. And this is absolutely unacceptable. Um, and uh, that's why we expect, actually, that the um, uh, security uh, agencies uh, here, that means police, uh, prosecutor, uh, but maybe also the intelligence uh, services, work together uh, to um, find actually those who have been responsible for the burning of the cars of Yesti, for the attack uh, on journalists, uh, for this uh, bomb attack uh, against uh, the Yesti uh, um, uh, newspaper. Um, 
for for uh, what happened in Berani, uh, uh, actually in the backyard uh, of this journalist, Mr. Softich, uh, or in uh, Nikšić, uh, where a journalist uh, has been beaten down. Daily uh, uh, So this is absolutely uh, unacceptable. And uh, what is even more worrying is actually that none of these cases so far has been uh, resolved. Uh, with the exception maybe uh, of the case of uh, Mrs. Lakic, uh, because... Uh, there are doubts about it? Uh, th even there are uh, doubts. Um, but so the general impression is that there is very little trust in the work of the investigative authorities. One of the reasons is, mm. probably I must mention that, the fact that police did not even hesitate to engage so-called volunteers in some particular investigations. And we have even uh, judicial confirmation for such uh, practice. Uh, and I repeat, I do not... Um, expect you to comment on ongoing investigations, but I do want to hear uh, uh, your position on the following. In order to re-establish this confidence, uh, how important is for the investigating uh, authorities to discover motives and people who potentially order these attacks on uh, media in Montenegro? This is something that media uh, which were under mm. attacks insist on. Yeah, no, um, I said it uh, already, it's absolutely uh, f f important uh, that uh, results uh, will be uh, produced because uh, Podgorica is not a multi-million big uh, metropolis like Karachi or Chicago and the handful of criminals uh, who are ready to do something like that, uh, to kill somebody, uh, to burn cars, uh, or to knock down uh, a journalist, uh, I think the handful of people, they should be known uh, who for a handful of dollars or, or euro uh, do almost everything. So uh, now actually this uh, commission has been established, a uh, mixed commission uh, with representatives of uh, the civil society, of the media, a uh, commission which is headed by the deputy mm -hmm. editor-in-chief of Dan. Uh, this is a good sign and they should uh, actually supervise um, and control this uh, process of investigation. But I ask you, how important is to reveal motives and people yeah, who uh, potentially stand behind it's not this. enough. It's not enough uh, to apprehend only those uh, who committed the crime. It is very important to find those who are, so to say, uh, th uh, who gave the orders uh, to do something like that. And. Um, as it appears uh, to me, I think there are certain mafia-style uh, circles uh, who actually uh, use such criminals uh, to intimidate uh, the press. And it would be uh, absolutely necessary to reach actually uh, those uh, who are behind this. There are some other versions um, uh, speaking mm. about that. Prime Minister. Milo Djukanovic has recently stated that behind some attacks on media mm. and police officials are hired criminals working for people who are part of the system. Uh, does this additionally oblige uh, the authorities to discover the motive and people behind uh, all definitely. these attacks? Definitely. This was an uh, interesting remark uh, uh, made uh, by the Prime Minister which intrigued uh, me and um, it's a certain possibility that there are erroneous circles uh, within, so to say, uh, the system uh, which are behind this, and then it would be even more important uh, actually to know who are these people and uh, eliminate them. Uh, but talking about these statements made mm. by uh, Prime uh, Minister, um, him and some other state of officials have claimed that uh, people responsible for these attacks are actually those who want to discredit this government. In the other words, uh, they in fact uh, claim that they were targets, not media, that uh, media were just some kind of collateral uh, damage. On the other hand, representatives of uh, media which are under continuous attacks accuse Prime Minister of creating the environment in which uh, such attacks are perfectly legitimate. Can you imagine a situation in which 
your chancellor, Angela Merkel, would publicly label any private media as mafia? The media situation in Germany is different. Um, uh, actually, uh, in Montenegro, we have this uh, polarization not only in the field of politics, of political parties, but also um, uh, in the field uh, of media. And there are practically two camps, uh, or three camps, uh, I would say, government-friendly, government-critical, and in between some uh, who are uh, more or less uh, neutral. And uh, the media, of course, uh, have uh, the responsibility uh, to do investigative uh, reporting and to criticize uh, the government um, uh, if the government makes uh, mistakes uh, or breaks uh, uh, even the rules. But uh, sometimes I have the impression the media go also a little bit uh, overboard uh, and um, uh, particularly since uh, defamation is not uh, part of the penal code uh, any longer. Um, some journalists uh, seem to be uh, very uh, careless actually in uh, raising public allegations even if they are not yet uh, proven. So uh, I think in Germany, uh, the media and the journalists are more careful. Of course, they are nevertheless very critical. And uh, mm -hmm. if you will remember, actually, the court case against our former uh, president for a uh, uh, very, uh, so to say, minor uh, issues. Uh, he had a prolonged... Uh, 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 go through a prolonged uh, court trial. Now, finally, he has been uh, acquitted. So, uh, I wanted to a, mention that we case. have a very high uh, level of sensibility if it comes uh, to things uh, which are morally or legally uh, not acceptable, even if it uh, touches uh, the, the highest uh, level. Um, but uh, the report. So do you understand the frustration of local media when it comes to that? Um, I understand uh, the frustration, but nevertheless, uh, I think um, the media. Because a lot, of, a lot of these things go unpunished. Uh, for a number of years. Yes, uh, but uh, the media situation in Germany is uh, different uh, from that one in uh, Montenegro. That's what I wanted to say. And but you uh, didn't answer my question. Uh, Can no. you imagine the situation in which? Chancellor Angela Merkel would label a media consortium or whoever, private media, as mafia, with no concrete evidence. Um, I think the, the wording uh, is, of course, uh, questionable. Uh, I do not uh, want uh, to comment now uh, the, the, the Prime Minister's statements here. But it's not helpful actually accusing uh, the media alone. Uh, I think it's a general uh, situation uh, here in uh, Montenegro, which uh, leads uh, actually uh, to uh, these very aggressive allegations and counter-allegations. Uh, I think a certain moderation would be necessary uh, and uh, the dialogue uh, and criticism also should be more constructive. Uh, sometimes I have the impression that uh, criticism can be also dist uh, uh, destructive uh, if it goes uh, beyond uh, certain uh, limits uh, and uh, 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 limits of uh, politeness uh, and uh, correctness. What would be the role of public media in that uh, process? And how do you see the role of public media such as Pobida, for instance, in uh, Montenegro? Daily Pobida, Pobida is still being financed uh, uh, from the budget despite the law hmm. prohibiting that uh, practice, while being constantly accused for stigmatization of government opponents. Do you believe that such editorial policy goes along with the uh, alleged government's intention to bring about professional media standards? Um, I think Pobjeda has to be uh, privatized. Uh, there is uh, no doubt. Um, I don't think uh, that uh, this will be acceptable, uh, that uh, one uh, journal uh, will be, so to say, indefinitely uh, supported uh, by state aid. Um, 
even though in the uh, strong sense uh, maybe it's not a violation of the EU acquis uh, uh, in competitiveness. Yeah? Of course, state aid, for example, to CAP uh, in the long run will be a violation uh, of the um, uh, uh, actually SAA, but it will be a violation uh, also of the chapter on competitiveness um, uh, of the EU uh, acquis. And uh, the question is, does it apply also to the media? There, there are uh, pros and cons, and uh, the question is not yet f fully clarified. But in any case, it's against the spirit, uh, actually, of uh, level playing field for the various uh, media, because all the media have to survive economically. And it's unfair if one, uh, so to say, uh, media is uh, supported uh, with uh, money from uh, the state uh, budget. So um, I have been uh, assured, uh, actually, that they're still seeking, uh, so to say, private uh, investors to take over of, uh, Popular. I have more and about uh, editorial policies and this... Uh, the editorial uh, policy has changed. They have a new uh, editor-in-chief uh, now. Practice that they are accused uh, of... The former editor-in-chief, uh, I wrote him once uh, a, uh, an email and uh, I explained to him uh, that it's a serious of articles or letters uh, which were published in Pobjeda denouncing actually journalists of other media uh, here in uh, Montenegro in a, such a mean uh, uh, way is absolutely uh, unacceptable. Uh, words were used which should never appear, uh, so to say, in a newspaper. Um, so I think um, there is an editorial responsibility for, of moderation and uh, of using uh, the right uh, words in criticizing actually those who are your political mm -hmm. opponents. Uh, the report of the European Commission noted the infiltration of organized crime into private and public sector. Prime Minister Milo Djukanovic mentioned that we talked about that earlier, that some <coughs> criminal figures are working for the people who are the part of the system. NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen praised Montenegro's progress, but uh, uh, highlighted that fighting against corruption and organized crime uh, uh, of security, uh, that we need reform of security agencies here in Montenegro in order to meet the standard of the alliance. Uh, how do you assess the quality of such reform? Uh, from uh, talking uh, to the representative of our uh, uh, federal uh, police uh, who is based in Belgrade but uh, who has an accreditation uh, also for uh, Montenegro and he comes regularly uh, to Montenegro to inform himself uh, about uh, the situation uh, here. We know that the cooperation between the German police uh, and the Montenegrin police is uh, very good. Uh, there is a high level of confidence in each other. There were cases of extradition of Montenegrins from uh, Germany to Montenegro and uh, vice versa. So. If, um, his comments are very encouraging uh, insofar as the professionalism and so the about security agencies uh, nature is concerned insofar as the security agencies uh, is concerned um, uh, of course uh, they operate uh, in a f f sphere of secrecy so we do not always uh, know exactly uh, how well uh, the reforms inside uh, the intelligence is really uh, progressing. But uh, what, is is confidence? <laughs> what is important actually is that the intelligence uh, services are put under parliamentary uh, control. And uh, apparently the Minister of Justice uh, tabled now a new draft uh, law which still has to go through the Cabinet uh, and through the Parliament, to my understanding, regulating actually the various security and intelligence uh, agency in Montenegro and their uh, cooperation. I think this shows uh, that uh, there are works uh, ongoing to improve uh, the present uh, situation. 
uh, it is necessary to have more control, uh, political control uh, over these agencies. They are not operating or should not be operating in a space, uh, so to say, which is uh, outside uh, the legal uh, system. That's exactly why I was, uh, why I asked you these uh, questions. How disturbing is the detail noted in the State Department's uh, report? Uh, about the suspicion in wiretapping of the opposition representatives, critiques of the regime, and even ambassadors. Have you yourself ever suspected to be wiretapped or under surveillance? Uh, <laughs> um. I will uh, not uh, actually uh, comment uh, now whether this uh, took place uh, or not, uh, because uh, then I would, of course, uh, reveal uh, what uh, we know about uh, this. <laughs> but uh, if this uh, an answer too. if this takes uh, place, uh, um, one has uh, to question uh, actually uh, whether this is uh, really uh, very uh, a very good idea or not. Because spying on friends uh, by a country which wants to become a member of the European Union and which wants to become a member of NATO, spying, so to say, on embassies of NATO member states or EU member states is not a good idea. It's a breach, uh, actually, of confidence. And not only a breach of confidence, it's uh, strictly by, by international law, it's also a breach of the Vienna uh, Convention on Diplomatic Relations. So, um, uh, uh, I would appeal, actually, uh, if certain uh, things are still uh, considered or done, better stop it. Uh, it's not a good idea. For, uh, and, um, of course, uh, we are not sleeping, and uh, that's why for, uh, it should be better um, uh, stopped if it's uh, still uh, c considered. And, of course, uh, the intelligence services have uh, an important role in every uh, state. Uh, it's counterintelligence, it's counterterrorism. Uh, they have to know about uh, the potential threats uh, in your country uh, from inside and uh, from outside. So ha they have an important task, uh, and there is so much to do for them uh, that they should focus uh, on their real tasks. Okay, I will not insist mm. further on this. I think I heard uh, enough. Support to NATO integration in Montenegro is still, as estimated, pretty low. Uh, the public is sharply divided about this issue. Uh, even government admits that up until recently, uh, communication strat strategy was um, unsatisfactory. Uh, authorities claim their commitment to this process. Uh, parties of ruling coalition states that this process is one of the most important links between the two. Despite that, SDP leader and the president of the parliament, uh, Mr. Anko Krivokapic, said not so long ago that his party and foreign partners have certain doubts regarding DPS's commitment towards NATO integration. Do you take these doubts seriously? Uh, taking uh, the, the representatives of the government uh, by their words, there is absolutely no doubt uh, that NATO membership uh, is a top uh, priority uh, for this uh, government. There may be uh, certain politicians inside the DPS who are not yet uh, fully convinced uh, whether this is the right option for Montenegro or not. But the leadership um, of um, the DPS uh, definitely uh, is uh, supporting uh, Euro-Atlantic integration. And if uh, it comes to the parliament, uh, the vast majority of the political parties uh, in parliament are supporting NATO membership. 
it would be, uh, I'm absolutely uh, sure, two-thirds, actually, if there would be a vote in Parliament, who would vote in favor of uh, NATO membership. Something like it's that. It's clear that DPS, uh, SDP, uh, that Positivnap um, uh, are in favor, that uh, PSP uh, is in favor. SDP maybe yeah. is uh, a little bit split. Uh, some privately say they are in favor, but the party has no clear line. So altogether there would be two-thirds uh, in favor, but uh, if you ask the people on the road, uh, then the support for NATO membership uh, is lower. This shows actually that there is a communication gap uh, between the parliament and the electorate. And now actually uh, I think the uh, political parties um, and particularly the members of parliament realized uh, that they have a duty to explain what the security policy options for Montenegro are for, to the public uh, to mobilize more the support for NATO membership. And um, there are only two options uh, actually for Montenegro, either to remain uh, neutral and uh, this is my uh, personal uh, conviction. Uh, um, uh, neutrality uh, is an illusion. Uh, for a small country like Me Montenegro with limited uh, financial resources, how will you assure your neutrality with a defense budget uh, of something like 40 million uh, euro? 80% uh, actually of this defense budget goes uh, into uh, salaries uh, and pensions, about 15% uh, percent, uh, so to say in operations because you have to buy fuel, you have to maintain uh, the buildings, etc. And what remains is approximately 5% to buy uh, new equipment. Mm -hmm. And 5% we'll of... Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, we'll talk more about uh, NATO, but... Uh, let me keep you a little bit more on this topic, this inconfidence coming from uh, SDP. Uh, how do you assess, how do you comment, uh, how do you see those relations in, uh, within a ruling coalition? Uh, Social Democratic Party is the part of the government, but on many very important issues lately, it voted along with opposition, leaving uh, DPS in hmm. minority. Does that seem as a stable, as a firm government well, uh, in the ruling in, coalition? In any, uh, What's your uh, impression? In any uh, coalition in, in Germany, as you know, we have a grand coalition and there are very often uh, serious tensions uh, between uh, the two uh, coalition partners uh, on certain uh, issues. But I those are very, very important strategic issues. But uh, insofar as the strategic issue of Euro-Atlantic integration is concerned, there is a great unanimity uh, between the That's two right. coalition uh, partners. Right. Uh, what uh, maybe the leader of the SDP put in doubt, uh, whether all DPS members uh, think but as the economic uh, strategy, for instance, is very different. In the economic strategy, if it comes to us. privatization, indeed, uh, there are major uh, differences. But... Um, this is uh, also uh, an outflow of the general uh, situation in the absence of a really strong opposition. Uh, the media or some of the media have overtaken uh, the role, so to say, uh, of an extra parliamentary uh, opposition. And that's why also the civil society uh, actually assumed this function uh, of a public uh, watchdog, which is very important and uh, it's very good that we have such a vibrant civil society. And uh, even the coalition, uh, junior coalition partner, sometimes plays a little bit, uh, so to say, uh, the role of an intra-governmental uh, opposition. I think this is And natural. that provoked uh, Prime Minister Milo Djukanovic to use the term parliamentary dictatorship. Are you familiar with that term in Western democracies? No, the parliament is uh, actually always uh, the sovereign, uh, so to say, uh, the power uh, actually in the parliament um, uh, cannot exert uh, a dictatorship. Uh, um, I don't know whether he was properly uh, interpreted. Uh, the parliament has a very strong power, uh, of course, uh, and this is right. So, um, 
but uh, insofar as uh, the junior coalition partner is concerned, I would not uh, attach overdue importance uh, to the uh, tensions uh, and disputes uh, they presently have uh, with uh, the DPS. Uh, this is natural in any coalition uh, wherever it is. Okay, uh, that's yeah. your, your impression. Um, let's go back to NATO. The main opposition entity, Democratic Front, mm. uh, does not have a clear stand regarding NATO. As you said, mm. um, its bigger constituent is against, uh, smaller is pro-NATO, mm. while the leader of this bloc has not yet stated uh, what would he exactly do in case of a referendum for which Democratic Front strives for. Could this undefined position of Democratic Front close some doors at international addresses for this political subject. Uh, we had a, um, a, f a public uh, forum uh, re recently which was co-organized uh, co by the German Embassy and by CDT, the Center for Democratic Transition, and we had a panel discussion uh, with Mr. Lekic, uh, the fraction leader of the DPS, Mr. Simovic, and uh, Mr. Mustafic uh, from the uh, Bosniak uh, party and I really admired the diplomatic skills of uh, Mr. Lekic, how he made the splits between the two constituents uh, of his uh, party because uh, one is in favor of NATO, he the was other one of yours, uh, is against. About his diplomatic so skills, the yeah. DF, uh, of course, um, uh, is in a very difficult position um, what to say about uh, this issue. I have the impression that at the moment uh, they are keeping their options uh, open, which is good, and they are ready for dialogue uh, on this issue. We had a very interesting discussion uh, for about Euro-Atlantic uh, integration, and this was something which was lacking for a very long time. Uh, there were very crude, so to say, um, pros and cons uh, exchanged uh, by NATO supporters and uh, by NATO uh, opponents. Now, actually, I think we are become, getting into a more uh, substantial, uh, factual discussion. What are the security options uh, for Montenegro? Mm -hmm. uh, the latest events in Ukraine, what message do they send regarding NATO integration of this particular Montenegro situation? Uh, this still has to be uh, seen uh, because uh, so far uh, we do not uh, know f what uh, exactly uh, f will happen now uh, with the eastern part uh, of what Ukraine so or, or, or uh, in the uh, Crimean. But uh, it shows uh, actually um, that there is uh, a certain urgency uh, to consider actually the various security policy uh, options. And um, if uh, you want uh, to uh, defend uh, yourself, uh, you normally, if you are not strong, you have to have uh, partners. And uh, NATO uh, in the post-war period provided a very high level uh, of security and stability uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, it was a counterbalance uh, during the time of the Cold War, which is long over now. Um, and um, I think it is only thanks uh, to uh, such a defensive uh, alliance uh, that peace has been uh, preserved for such a very long period uh, of time, from 45 uh, to 2014. The longest uh, period of peace uh, which we had in Europe, if, uh, of course with the exception uh, of the Balkan uh, the wars uh, here. So, uh, Montenegro should really think uh, twice against the background um, of what's happening uh, right now in Ukraine, uh, what its options are. Mm -hmm. But to go a little bit deeper in this uh, Ukraine uh, scenario, former German Chancellor, Mr. Gerhard Schroeder, recently stated that situation in Crimea represents the violation of international law. He also added that he himself while being the German Chancellor, violated international law during Kosovo crisis. Hmm. I'm sure you read that uh, statement. This statement is in line with Putin's statement, who already compared Crimea and Kosovo. 
Uh, well, uh, this is actually an interpretation uh, of history, and uh, frankly speaking, um, I don't fee, uh, find much uh, benefit uh, in uh, discussing uh, history uh, um, uh, as it is done uh, here in the Balkans. Um, as you know, uh, some people who are against NATO in Montenegro might use this uh, uh, yeah. argument that's, that's um, coming from your former um, chancellor. But, uh, uh, you know, f before I came to Montenegro, I was seven years ambassador in Asia, three years in Cambodia, four years in, in Mongolia. And the basic difference, uh, which um, I find actually between uh, the peoples uh, in East Asia and here in the Balkans is that the mindset uh, of the people in Asia f is actually future oriented. Here in the Balkans, you are too preoccupied uh, with the past. Uh, and for some politicians in particular, things which happened uh, in the 14th century are still more important uh, than what is happening now and what will be happening uh, in the future. This happened 15 uh, years ago. Though. This it's happened 15 years ago and uh, this was a last resort because all attempts actually to convince the Milosevic uh, regime uh, to stop the ethnic uh, cleansings uh, and to stop uh, to repeat actually what happened in Bosnia, in Kosovo, failed actually. All the sanctions uh, which were implied did not have the desired effect uh, and so it was a last resort to use uh, force actually to stop the regime, to commit uh, crimes here in the Balkans. And it was, uh, of course, uh, the Red-Green uh, coalition, the coalition of uh, Chancellor uh, Gerhard Schröder and uh, the leader of the Green Party in Germany, Joschka Fischer, actually, who supported actually a military intervention uh, in the uh, Kosovo uh, conflict. And Joschka Fischer, our foreign minister, he was a pacifist uh, originally, but on the other hand, uh, he was convinced that uh, the international community should not allow actually um, um, that something uh, like what, what happened in Germany during the time of National Socialism should uh, be repeated uh, here in the Balkans and that this justified a humanitarian uh, intervention. But this, no matter how this, justifiable no, but, those actions But this actions was were. a totally yeah. different uh, situation than the situation which we have now in, in the Crimea. In the Crimea, none of the Ukrainians living on the Crimea and of course uh, the uh, ethnic uh, Ukrainians on the Crimea are a minority and the Russians are a majority but none of the, uh, the members of this minority were threatened uh, or uh, the other way around the, the Russian minority uh, majority was not threatened uh, actually uh, by uh, the Ukrainian uh, government. But strictly formal. Uh, so this and is to not what a extent is the inter that's yeah. why I asked this. Yeah. To what extent is the international law today subject of free interpretation by world powers. <laughs> a lot of people talk about that. Yeah, international law, of course, is always uh, open uh, to interpretation to a much higher uh, extent than uh, national law because there is no authority on the international law, so to say, to enforce this legislation. Mm -hmm. We do not have, so to say, a world uh, prosecutor in a world uh, Supreme Court. Uh, it's the United Nations, uh, so to say, which is a body which can pass resolutions and recommendations. But in the end, uh, international law uh, never uh, has the same power as um, uh, national law. And uh, I think the situation in Kosovo and in the Crimea uh, is totally uh, different. Uh, in Kosovo, it was a humanitarian intervention. Thank you, clarify in that. In the Crimea, it's a purely p political intervention. Uh, you assessed earlier that trade exchange between Montenegro and Germany was not on satisfying uh, level. Mm. You emphasize that German investors mm. care most about the legislative mm. frame, uh, absence of corruption and transparency of Definitely. business. As far as I know, there is, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is no significant direct German investment here in Montenegro if we exclude uh, Deutsche Telekom, which came in Montenegro through Magyar uh, mm. Telekom. Uh, does that mean that Germany does not recognize Montenegro as a favorable and safe uh, destination for investments? 
that would be uh, an uh, exaggeration. Um, of course, uh, the German investment uh, in Montenegro and German trade with Montenegro is far beyond uh, under uh, the um, uh, potential which uh, our two countries uh, have. In Serbia, for example, uh, Germany is the investor number one at the moment. Uh, there are uh, countless uh, German companies uh, investing uh, in uh, Montenegro, I uh, in, in Serbia, I just heard that uh, Mercedes uh, yeah, is why going uh, Why to there are no companies in uh, uh, Montenegro in is in Montenegro. a very, very small uh, market. So from the perspective of German companies, um, first of all, uh, because of the size, it's not attractive uh, enough. Secondly, the potential of Montenegro is not enough known uh, in Germany. And thirdly, actually, there were some negative experiences made by German companies uh, doing business uh, here. And as you said already, for all investors coming from uh, Germany... What bad experiences? What, uh, what did you have in mind? Uh, legal security, uh, absence uh, of uh, corruption, transparent administrative uh, procedures when it comes to uh, building constructions, getting permissions, etc. Uh, are so of you great, had some uh, bad import. experiences. Right? We had some small companies uh, who made bad experiences, who lost their investments uh, here. And uh, of course, the word spreads. Uh, and uh, one, so to say, bad experience sometimes counts more than 10 good uh, experiences. So Montenegro has to build uh, a reputation of uh, providing a good investment uh, climate and advertise uh, its potential, then automatically I think uh, German companies uh, will come uh, if um, uh, also your traditional uh, situation um, uh, it will be improved in the framework of EU uh, accession. It's not only the Deutsche Telekom, which uh, of course is behind Magyar Telekom, uh, which took over uh, Telekom Cernagora. We have a German company as an investor in Budva, uh, Wassertechnik Essen, WTE, which uh, financed, uh, designed, built, and which will operate the wastewater treatment plant of Budva. This is a 60 million uh, euro project, mm -hmm. so it's not just peanuts, it's a big uh, project. And uh, this wastewater treatment plant, uh, which will be of uh, considerable importance uh, for Budva, where you have so many uh, hotels and so far, they all discharge uh, actually their wastewaters uh, into the sea. And depending on the wind and uh, current uh, conditions, uh, all this dirt comes back to the shores and represents a danger for the tourists. So this uh, treatment plant will be uh, commissioned, uh, put in operation end of March. Uh, there will be an inauguration ceremony. And this same company won a contract now to build also the wastewater treatment plant in Tivat. Mm -hmm. So this is a good example, uh, actually, of German companies mm -hmm. uh, doing business. We have uh, only a few more minutes, and I have a yeah. couple more mm -hmm. questions for you. So I'll ask yeah. you, please, to be uh, <laughs> sure. brief. Uh, speaking of telecom, uh, it was announced the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission will not pursue with the process on alleged corruption uh, related to the mm. privatization of the telecom here in Montenegro. You yourself said to local media that uh, this case was closed. At least this is how you were interpreted in uh, yeah. local media. However, the U.S. Embassy clarified that this commission has conducted civil trial against Straub, independently from any possible proceedings conducted by Montenegrin authority. It was pointed out that the Commission's decision not to proceed does not presume findings in terms of one's innocence or guilt. Uh, U.S. Embassy expects Montenegrin authorities to investigate allegations of illegal conducts in this particular case. How about you? What's your position on that? Uh, 
Uh, well, I'm the German ambassador, not the American or, no, Hunga I'm, I'm or Hungarian ambassadors. That's why uh, I have only a limited capacity uh, to, to we answer are talking about, uh, uh, this question. Uh, American but, but what Security is, and Exchange but Commission. What is a, a you already fact? commented on that. Yeah, I already commented uh, uh, on that. And uh, what I said is actually that the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, dismissed uh, the penal case uh, against uh, for Magyar Telecom and the officials of Magyar Telecom which were involved in the privatization. And um, you were not interpreted yeah. in the right way, I suppose. Uh, so maybe they dropped the penal. Uh, of, there might be they still uh, a civil uh, case uh, ongoing. But um, uh, insofar as the penal case is concerned, this regards now only uh, the privatization of the telecom uh, in uh, Macedonia, uh, not in Montenegro. What the Montenegrin prosecutor uh, will do, I do not know. Uh, you have to ask uh, the uh, prosecution uh, here. I will, but insofar as the, the German telecom uh, is uh, concerned, first of all, there were no German uh, managers of telecom uh, involved. Uh, this was investigated also by uh, the prosecutor in, in Germany. And uh, telecom now has uh, actually a system actually if, um, uh, in place uh, which prevents uh, for the future uh, such uh, uh, cases. Uh, we have a compliance officer at the level of the board uh, of Deutsche Telekom and at the level of all its uh, subsidiaries. And Deutsche Telekom uh, actually provided all the necessary documents uh, for, uh, to the authorities uh, here. And uh, they are working with full uh, transparency. So if there is still anything, uh, for, it's up now to uh, the Montenegrin authorities uh, to follow this. Uh, but uh, insofar as Deutsche Telekom uh, is concerned, uh, there is nothing uh, actually we can do. I understand. Do. You recently stated that building of highway in Montenegro is more a, of a political than economic uh, project. You also assess that investment return um, would be minimal or even negative. The World Bank also decided to withdraw, I suppose you read that, uh, it's 50 million dollars support uh, to Montenegrin budget saying that the highway deal uh, uh, agreed with China would put too much strain on uh, Montenegro's finances. There were some comments, uh, and I'm sure you heard them, regarding your statement, saying that you have directly interfered with government's economic uh, policy. Do you believe you were out of line? And uh, you know, this uh, is always what problem. was your uh, yeah. key concern? Yeah, I'm, I'm always asked so many uh, questions uh, on my opinion. If I say something, uh, for them, and if they don't like uh, my answer, they say I'm interfering in the internal affairs. I'd like to hear uh, your What <laughs> I wanted to say is that it's a politically very important uh, project. There is no doubt, uh, because uh, what we need is a better connection between the impoverished north of Montenegro with the central uh, and southern parts of Montenegro, which are economically uh, much more prosperous developed, uh, right. and, and uh, developed. And this is important for the integrity uh, of uh, the Montenegrin uh, state uh, to have good connections between all uh, parts uh, of the country. So politically, it is a very important country, uh, a very important project. But, uh, Which you understand. But what I doubt is actually uh, that if, uh, and this is my understanding, you built a four-lane uh, autobahn, a four-lane uh, autoput uh, from uh, nowhere to nowhere now, from Podgorica to Kolashin uh, practically, um, uh, whether there will be a positive uh, return uh, on investment. Politically, it's an important uh, project. Uh, and it will have also positive economic effects, uh, uh, no doubt, uh, but whether they will be sufficient to pay back an 800 million euro loan, this is another question. And I Are think you worried that public debt might explode? Uh, exactly. And this is also the assessment uh, of the World Bank. Um, 
That's why actually they withdrew their offer to provide Montenegro with a 50 million uh, budgetary assistance. Instead, actually, they'll finance certain projects uh, here in Montenegro now. And speaking about the indebtment, um, um, I'm very uh, impressed and very supportive uh, for the uh, measures adopted uh, by the Minister uh, of Finance. Uh, and these are very important because speaking about the investment, uh, you have to know that uh, the total indebtment of Montenegro since 2007, in just seven years, more than doubled. In 2007, the total indebtment of Montenegro was at 27 percent. Now Today it's we, are at, to 60. we are at 58 percent. And if you add actually the indebtment of the municipalities uh, and uh, the publicly owned uh, companies, then you are well over 60%, which are the Maastricht uh, criteria. And Montenegro has a euro already as a national currency. If you want to keep it, uh, you have to fulfill the convergence criteria. You have to subject yourself uh, to the Maastricht criteria. That means you have to bring down your deficit spending. You have to bring down your total indebtment. You have to limit your inflation. So you do not and, want another Greece in uh, uh, EU. We do not want uh, to have another Greece or Cyprus uh, and we do not want to run in a situation where we have to rescue Montenegro already at a time before it even becomes a member of the EU. Mr. Mm. Fischer, thank you very much for thank this you. interview and for your thank time. Thank you. Uh, to je bilo to za večeras. Vidimo se narednog četvrtka u istom termin.